registered nurse and Denise Dubois, Reality Works product manager. Denise has been with Reality Works for 10 years and is a frequent presenter, trainer, blogger for all things related to real care baby, health sciences, and soft skills. Denise has over 20 years of education, marketing, product design, curriculum, and curriculum writing experience. She is also a current member of the Executive Council for NCHSE. Two great resources for today's presentations. Denise will be introducing Casey, but before we get started, I wanted to cover a couple things. First, today's presentation is being recorded and all attendees will receive a link to that recording as well as a link to the PowerPoint presentation. You should see that within 24 hours after the presentation. We will have time at the end for a Q&A session, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the chat feature or the Q&A um, buttons at the bottom. With that being said, I'm going to pass things over to Denise to get us going. Thanks a lot, Emily, and welcome everyone to our session today on designing simulation-based lessons for high school students. And I'm, and I'm honored to have uh, Casey Carlson, who's going to be our guest presenter today. Casey is a curriculum technology manager, and she's also a frequent pro new product collaborator with RealityWorks. So Casey, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, today we're gonna be talking about utilizing simulation-based content in the post-COVID world, uh, best practices to integrating simulation into lesson content to engage students and then discover what simulation can and could look like in a high school CTE program. So how did COVID change education? Well, it definitely did. Um, it has changed education probably as we know it forever. Um, we do know that over a billion children are out of the classroom worldwide, forcing the rise of e-learning. And children's parents, teachers, schools, and the companies, everyone had to adjust. So the question is, what do we do now? There's so much uncertainty about what education is going to look like in the future, but let's take what we know works and let's think about how to give it to students in an optimal learning experience. So um, preparing the future is really important when we take a look at high school students and career technical education has many benefits to this. Studies have shown that students involved in uh, career, career technical education are less likely to drop out of and have about a 93% graduation rate. 45% of students have said that career technical education courses help them better understand their academic classes. And in most high schools, um, the career technical education courses and programs qualify as dual enrollment credits with local colleges. Uh, so it's very important to um, check your um, school system and your state to see um, how those credits will transfer for the students so you can better help guide them. So purpose of simulation, we all know that education is more than just readings and lessons and exams nowadays. Simulation provides that real life touch on concepts and truly brings them alive. Simulation can be used to practice skills or assess skills. So in normal circumstances, we would see curriculums with both. However, COVID really changed our perspective on things. You know, it's difficult to get students the technology they need to be successful online. So therefore, any simulation completed really should be done without penalty. Think of it as practicing for success. Now, I do know that more of you, so there could be some of you uh, that are more traditional educators and would like to use simulation as that assessment, which means they get that final grade for that. And I completely understand that. So to take consideration um, when you're doing that though, just think about the possible technical difficulties and the unusual maybe classroom setups the students are going to be facing at that point in time. It is very important to give students then more than one chance um, at their final grade and maybe perhaps take the highest of the two grades um, that they get during that simulation. Uh, I think we need to be really conscious of the changes that the, we're putting the students under at this point and they really don't need any undue pressures. Um, but I do understand the need for that, uh, the, that final assessment and using simulation to do that. So all schools um, have some sort of digital learning platform, usually such as maybe Google Classroom or Canvas. And then some school, school, schools are planning face-to-face -face sessions. Some schools at this point um, 
don't know what they're going to be doing for the fall, some are doing a combination of online and a combination of face to face. And um, of course, we don't know what's going to it's going to look like in the fall. Um, but this webinar will give you ideas for both. So before we start looking at really integrating simulation, we need to talk about best practices for preparing students for the simulation. Whether you are online or face to face, it is important to follow basically four simple steps. Plan, prepare, simulate, and reflect. This is repetitive, but um, with simulation, there really should be no surprises. So we're going to take a look at these more in depth. So our first step is plan. This is where you as an educator will get to design your experience for the student. The layout should be consistent every week. And you need to think about what is needed for the success of the students because you want them to, to, to succeed. So um, what readings do, would they need to do? Um, what videos would they need to watch? Um, make sure you look at your objectives in the curriculum and know exactly how they will be met with that simulation. And as a curriculum manager, this is the most common mistake I actually see. This is a great example of what I call a mismatch mistake. Um, let's say you have an objective of explaining the purpose of the equipment used to take blood pressure. When asked how the students will meet that objective, I've had people, teacher respond, well, the students will demonstrate how to take the blood pressure. Well, that doesn't match your objective though. Students could take the blood pressure without really knowing the purpose of the equipment. So my question would be, do you want the students to explain, you know, the purpose of the equipment or do you want them to demonstrate the blood pressure or do you want both? Um, this is a real simple thing, but it has to be very, very clear to the students that this is the objective that they are meeting. And I know this may be simple, but um, I have run across many, many PhD educators that even make this mistake. So uh, always match your objectives with your plan. Now, this is an example of how the plan could be set up in an online format. And this is kind of looks like um, a Canvas setting. Um, and everything is clearly laid out for the student. This would be like for unit one and then repeated for following units. Remember that we're setting up students for success. So both students and parents should be able to look at the layout and know what to do. As far as the objectives go, they could be a separate area or incorporated with each of the com content. And either way, um, they should be present. So pre-simulation preparation is the content or the material provided at a specific time in advance of the simulation experience. So those are those readings, the presentations, and the lectures. I really want to stress um, for the educators on the line, uh, please work together with other educators that teach the same material. Um, we want to make sure that students get the same information. Um, if you're using the same simulation, they should get the same pre-simulation pre pre preparation that um, all the students do. And I say this because, um, for example, I have two high school um, students, um, they, are they took the English class that they took and they each got two totally different preparation for their assignments. And we had to actually share information and share resources. And really students should need to share resources if they're taking the same class or meeting the same concept. Um, the resources should be the same for all students so that everybody has the equal um, chance of succeeding. So traditionally, um, you know, within this time period, there should be some sort of self-assessment or reflection at this point to identify gaps in their knowledge. The self-assessment um, actually plays a role after the simulation is complete, as it will show the students what they have learned. They won't be able to say, it was a waste of my time, or I didn't learn anything, because part of this step is to prepare students for that simulation as well. It's important to orientate them to whatever simulation or simulator um, you will be using, whether that's in person or via a video. Make sure you explain any equipment that they will be using and also go over simulation guidelines and expectations. So 
So here's an example of guidelines that um, we use in the RealityWorks simulation kits. Um, the guidelines are set to set the stage for that supportive learning and in a safe environment. These should vary upon the simulation, but relatively be similar in nature. If you're using simulation for assessment, you may also want to incorporate a confidential confidentiality statement so that the students won't um, become aware of, the, of uh, the, the scenario being used. So for example, um, if you are testing them on um, some, uh, something to do with critically thinking through a scenario and each of them have to go through that scenario, if they talk amongst themselves, which you know they, they will and they do, uh, then the last person that goes has all that information. So the idea of it is everyone should have the same information going into it so that they each can do their own simulation. And that confidentiality agreement is sometimes very important, especially if you're doing it with assessments. So just like we prepared the students, um, it is important for the educator also to be prepared. Um, make sure that you are aware of how the simulation should go and how to be the facilitator for that simulation. The best way to prepare for a simulation is to do it yourself. Um, try to anticipate things that could go not as intended. Um, everyone will do simulation a little bit different and sometimes differences are not wrong. Um, I came from a nursing program and we would have our faculty actually go through the simulations themselves so they actually could empathize with the students. They could see where um, students could possibly falter. Um, maybe they faltered. You know, there's a lot of stress that goes into actually doing simulation and being um, observed doing something. And students are not used to that. Um, sometimes they're used to just, uh, you know, maybe playing with the simulator and it, 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 there's no high stakes around that. But like I said, whether you're practicing or whether you're using it for assessment, we want to make sure that you as the educator know that full experience of doing that yourself. Um, those differences in the simulations and how students do them actually make for great discussions after the simulation is finished. There should not be any passive learning in simulation. And yes, you will have students say, I learn best by just watching, <laughs> but that's not the idea of simulation. Simulation is a hands-on activity. So really strongly encourage the students um, to, to do and not watch. When we think of simulation, we instantly think about hard skills that demonstrating of doing something. And what we also need to consider and what works best online is the soft skills. So really looking at that communication, teamwork, critical thinking, and empathy, just to name a few. When you look at your simulation, try to identify the hard skills and then also the soft skills. Okay, so for those schools, that um, have face-to-face -face simulation or will be doing face-to-face -face simulation, we do know that there will probably be additions of masks or gloves and social distancing um, when they're able to. The groups may be smaller and at time, um, you know, the time together may be limited. So really think what needs to be done hands-on versus what could be done online. So for example, let's um, talk about learning to take a blood pressure. Um, the actual act of taking the blood pressure is difficult to do virtually. That would make a better hands-on simulation, um, and you don't need to necessarily have a patient. There are simulators that we have that, you know, have the blood pressure cuff uh, like on an arm. So we don't even need that human-to-human -human contact for blood pressures. Um, however, um, the patient interaction part may be um, how they introduce themselves or how they talk, they, how they explain um, what a blood pressure is um, to the person um, or, you know, maybe have them explain what the results are or what they need. That all can be done using online discussions or even um, having a conversation over a webcam. So for those um, also schools that will have online and the students cannot enter the classroom, um, you can still do simulation. So um, webcams are probably the best 
opportunity you have for this, and a vast majority of tablets and laptops have a built-in webcam. Um, the question is, does your students need, know how to use it? So sometimes you might have to do an introduction activity so that they can get used to utilizing the webcam purposes. A lot of them are, I would probably say most of them are probably used to doing some type of web, webcams, um, especially if they're used to cell phones, doing selfies, um, Snapchatting, things like that. Um, but webcams can really give a good first person perspective on um, completing a simulation. So here are some ways. You can use your webcam, or if you happen to have things like a GoPro of some sort, um, and actually go through the simulation. So I'm gonna use this picture as an example. This is an example of um, our, like a, a geriatric and medication administration kit that we have. And the student would put on glasses that maybe simulate glaucoma or other eye, is, eye problems. And you could actually use the webcam to show students what it looks like through those glasses um, because they don't all have the glasses at home but you could show them that. So they have that perspective of, oh, it's blurry. Oh, you know, I can't see the right side of, you know, of things. And you can actually see what, it, you know, show them what it looked like just using the webcam. Um, the other um, option that you can have is to use what students have at home. So um, you see in this picture here, she has a pair of gloves on. Well, we could have the students find a pair of gloves or socks even, um, you know, to attempt to do just simple household things. Um, they'll still get that hands-on experience and the knowledge you give them. So, um, and don't trust that they'll just do the work on, your, on their own because we know high school students um, all too well. Um, they, <laughs> so it'd be something that you'd want them to, to do together as a group. So for instance, you could be on a Zoom meeting you could have um, all the students be on their cameras, even though that a lot of them don't wanna be on their cameras, have them be on their cameras, have them have their socks and gloves and everything else, and something in front of them that they have to open or unscrew, something around the, the house. And have them actually all do that at once so that they can see how that feels. Um, it would be a lot of fun, it could be a lot of laughs, um, but they will all learn something. Okay, at minimal, you should have them participate in some type of online discussion board talking about their experiences. The other thing is the soft skills. So how could you incorporate those? Just really think through that and as you move on. So our final step after you go through simulation, whether it is um, a face-to-face -face simulation or an online simulation, you need to have the students stop and reflect. Um, there should be a, called a debriefing. Provide time for the students to reflect on their experiences. Always review the objectives again. And there's actually three phases of the reflection and debriefing. So the beginning allows students to express their emotional reactions to things, helps identify participants' concerns, and then helps you guide objectives to be covered. Some simulations um, are very, very simple, and there's not a whole lot of emotional reactions to things. However, some um, simulations make students feel uncomfortable. Um, simulations could be stressful. Um, it could have gone very much not the way the students wanted it to go. And so to get all of those emotions out right of way is good because they will be able to move on then to the middle and ending phases. The middle phase is your analysis phase, and that helps the learners move towards accomplishing course objectives and involve the participants in that discussion regarding why events occurred. And the ending is your summary phase, where important points are reviewed and participants summarize what they have learned. So let's talk about these steps individually. So the emotions, um, like I said, the emotions can be quite strong during simulations. Um, and after all, we are telling them that we're simulating real life and experience maybe that they have not had before. So sometimes it brings up past experiences that the students have not had closure on. Um, remember that this is a safe environment and the students should be able to express their feelings without targeting other students. So nothing should be made personal. And it's very important to manage your upset students or the students that are targeting 
another student. So reassure everyone that this is just practice and focus on the events, not what one person did. For the analysis phase, I like the plus delta method. It's one of the easiest methods for debriefing. And this is done during, the, um, during that middle phase. Ask what went well, that's the plus part of the simulation. And if done again, what would you have changed? That's the delta. Again, this is not to say anything bad about one student. We're talking about the objectives and we're talking about the event and concept learned. Have each student reflect on what they did well, what they would change personally, and focus on that reflective part. I actually do the in a face to face. I put this up on a whiteboard, and I put up the plus and the delta. And I actually give students, you know, the dry erase markers, and they can go up there and they can fill in what they think went well, what they think that they would have changed. It works really good. Um, we get a lot of feedback on it, and then no one feels bad about things. So um, really think about, you know, summarizing those objectives, um, making sure everyone, um, as, as they go forth, you know, uh, realizes what they have all learned. Like I said, on that self-assessment, it's really important to, you know, revisit that again so they don't walk away saying, I didn't learn anything. Everybody learned something. To prepare, though, um, for all this process, um, make sure you are comfortable with your online technologies, okay? And I know that this has been a very big learning curve for some educators, moving from a face-to-face -face environment to an online environment. Um, but, you know, learn about your webcam, learn about your technologies, and um, take a deep breath. <laughs> Being creative and thinking outside the box during COVID times um, may take teamwork. So talk to your educators, talk to your per, um, resource personnel, brainstorm how to bring that simulation to your students. And once again, make sure you are sharing your resources and videos. I know as an educator um, that I was very coveted of my stuff. I don't like to share, play nice in the sandbox. But the thing is, when it comes to the student experience and the student's success, if you have a really great video of how you demonstrated something, please share it. Um, it makes the world of difference to the students. And I think that's what we all have to remember. It's not about us as educators and what we made. Um, it is really seriously about the student's experience. So um, the other thing, uh, an option is to create simulation packages for your students um, and issue them out with tablets, especially if you are in a fully online uh, environment for teaching in the fall. Uh, and, and I say this because this has worked um, with some of the schools already. Um, this method was um, used by um, one of the local tech colleges as well. Um, it allowed students to have a small amount of supplies that they could use to record and return demonstrations of skills. Um, obviously, no, nothing with needles or anything like that, um, nothing they could injure themselves with, but we had like tubing and, and um, little cups, you know, for um, medications and things like that, just these small little things. Um, everything else was online. The teachers didn't have mannequins, obviously, at home to record skills. So um, this picture was actually one of my friends. Um, she used a stuffed animal um, to um, explain, to, this was supposed to be um, suctioning, and um, they did just fine. The students actually set up their own little stuffed animals with their little tubing and everything, and it worked perfectly. You should have seen the videos. It was actually very, very impressive of what the students did, and they had fun doing it. Um, you really have to remember what your objectives are. You want to maybe see how they do something or maybe the technique they use. And we have to realize during these times that, uh, you know, if they, they get it, you know, 80% of it um, is probably a, a good thing. Um, no one's gonna be perfect unless they actually have all of the supplies and the big simulators at home. All right, so um, role play is one of the other and most underutilized simulation types. Um, you could assign certain students to be patients and give them a scenario to act out. At first, students are quite leery to do this, um, but they have all had very good learning experiences between students. 
And I've tried this and I was pleasantly surprised once again at their acting abilities. Um, of course there was, um, there wasn't really, um, we have to always make sure that we set, you know, we're professionalism guidelines. Um, if there's any unprofessionalism with it, um, points were taken off, you know, when they did that with me, but, um, other option is just to role play soft skills, just like basic communication. Remember our students are all cell phone um, users. So communication can lack a little bit and thus the soft skills need to be practiced. So let's kind of walk through something. So, um, this is a kind of a practice. Um, this would be set up in a live meeting platform. I would um, encourage you to, and I know we're not doing this today, but I would encourage you to really see the faces in your classroom um, so that you know that they're paying attention, they are participating, and um, they're part of a team. That's very important in online. So today's objective, we're gonna walk through this, is discuss the impact of unprofessional behavior in the workplace. So what I want you to do is imagine that we all work at the same fast food place. And I'm going to give you a scenario and some roles. And your job is to put yourself in those roles and answer my questions honestly. So here's the scenario. We have a coworker and her name is Allison. She's pictured here, she was just hired. She's very eager to learn, but she's quite shy. And you have heard others make fun of her and talk about her behind her back. And one day, one of your coworkers says, hey, we should play a joke on her. Let's take her cell phone and hide it. And some of the coworkers think that this is a really funny idea. So um, I want you to take a second, think about that, put yourself in that, um, that scenario. All right, next slide. So now I want you to think, you are all the coworkers that think this is a good idea. Let's play the joke. So I want you to respond on why you think this is a good idea. So today, you know, um, if you'd like to respond, you can. Um, otherwise, um, you know, if you want to use the chat, otherwise um, you can, uh, what I would do is just, you know, have the students kind of one by one, just share what they would think. Now they could say, oh, it's harmless, you know, it's a fun thing to do. Um, we'll, we'll give the cell phone back and everything. Um, so then the next slide. Now I want you to imagine yourself as all the coworkers that were against the prank, all right? Why would you be against the prank? Well, some people could say, well, I could get in trouble. Kind of mean, okay? Would you say anything, you know, to those people that wanted to carry out the prank? Well, I'd maybe tell them, um, don't get us in trouble or it's not nice to do. I don't know. Next slide. So let's say the prank happens and our phone is gone. She reports it to her manager and now you are all the managers, okay? And you find out about the prank. What would you say to all the coworkers then? Maybe things like pranks are considered bullying. It's not tolerated here. There's maybe consequences for the pranks. You might lose your job. Next slide. And finally, I want all of you to put yourself as Allison. How did it make you feel? Maybe students would say, well, I felt like I don't belong or they don't like me. And then say, well, what are you going to say to your coworkers back after you find out about the prank? And I'm sure some people would say nothing. I don't think I'd say anything. And then the question would be, well, do you want to stay working there? No. And I want everyone to think, if Allison leaves, how does that impact the workers, the managers? Think about that. Well, the workers may have to cover her shifts. They might work down a person. Manager will have to spend time hiring and orientating somebody new. So now that we did a little um, role playing there, um, we have to do our debriefing, right? So like all simulations, we have to debrief and, re and reflect. So what emotions did you feel during the role play? Well, some people might say, well, I, was, I felt anger. I felt sadness. I felt bad for her. 
what do you think you did well? Well, um, you know, I, I think I chose my words well. Um, I, you know, I tried to address my coworkers the, the, about the prank. Then I'd ask what would change. And some people might say, well, after I thought about Allison's perspective, I might not have been part of the prank. I maybe would have said different things. And the biggest thing, remember our objective was do you, you know, about the understanding of unprofessionalism. Do you have a greater understanding of the impact of unprofessionalism in the workplace? And the answer would be yes. So note how the role play was presented. I deliberately had the students think as in they were in different people's roles. This builds empathy and it also builds understanding it actually makes the students stop and really think. And this is the really the key to soft skills and it can be done very well in an online environment. So um, I hope you enjoyed this webinar and our role playing. And I see there's a couple questions in the chat so I'll um, um, address them. If you have other questions, please put them in the chat as well. I appreciate it. So the question is um, from Sharon, um, who you utilize video of, um, or I don't say if it's do you use utilize video of a skill as a clinical application? Um, I yes, I I I like um, as an as an instructor, I like to use video, and I like the students to use video on the way back. I think it really shows them actually. Uh, you know, how much do they really understand of the concept. Um, the videos could be short. Um, really watch the timing on videos because, it, you know, things that get to be 10, 15 minutes long are very, very difficult to, to upload. So short and sweet. Um, you can chunk videos as well. And um, they can use their cell phones to record videos. Um, and nothing fancy. Um, they, you know, step them through, give them instructions on how to um, upload a, a video to uh, your learning management system like Canvas or Google Classroom. Um, there's usually online instructions to do that. And um, it actually is very, it is actually very useful. Once students get used to doing it, it will be second nature. And I've been very surprised, especially with high school students, um, you know, if you give them instructions, they can follow it. And also to the parents can help them follow it as well. Um, even the most parents who are scared of technology, if you lay, lay out those instructions of how to make a video, it, it really works well. Um, I'd also talk to other programs that maybe before they get to you, um, maybe you're utilizing video in another classroom, how are they doing it? So that those, those video instructions are consistent across classes and that really helps students with the videos. Um, and Another question is, is there a way or place educators can share scenarios they have created to teach uh, patient care skills? There are some, if you um, do Google um, scenarios, open, open education resources, it's OER um, scenarios. There are some scenarios out there um, that already are made for patient care skills. What the, um, some of the issues are is that they're not, it may be age appropriate or level appropriate. So you might have to adjust those, but there are scenarios out there. Um, anything that comes from RealityWorks has um, the curriculum built in with the scenarios, the checklists, everything is there for you um, that's part of our products. Okay, Casey, do you see any other questions out there? Otherwise, we've got a few other resources that we would like to share with everybody. Sure. All right. So we always like to connect with, with um, customers and participants in our webinars. And, and one way you can do that is we, we have a blog and you can see the link there on the screen. But um, at that blog, we invite guest blog writers to share best practices. Maybe you'll get some more uh, classroom ideas for this fall. Uh, sometimes there's new product launch information there. So a great place for you to go to. Um, we also have uh, Facebook. Um, we also have Twitter and things like that. And we also do have other free webinars like the one today. Um, we have uh, many more on health science uh, topics as well as soft skills. So um, if you're interested in participating in more webinars in the future, you can go out to our, our webinar button on our, on our um, rallyworks.com 
and you can sign up and you always get the recording um, after it and um, certificate of, of participation um, like you did today. Um, one other thing we wanted to point out to you that's uh, brand new to Reality Works is something called our simulations or skills sim kits. And these are kits for, we have three for nursing and two for CNA right now. They are uh, uh, classroom kits where they focus on a specific topic. We have uh, adult acute care, pediatrics, um, we have uh, geriatric medication management, and then we have one on mobility impairment and sensory impairment. But in these, uh, it's like a kit in a box where you get uh, three different scenarios that all focus on that same topic. And in there, um, you have uh, scenario roles laid out. Um, like Casey was saying, role playing, it makes it very easy. It's set up for you. Uh, simulation setup, uh, patient descriptions are included. There are pre-brief and debrief questions and activities already prepared for you. So we are trying to make it as easy as possible for instructors to uh, do things like that in the classroom. So again, uh, when you get that, the box, and it also includes some um, hands-on props that are needed to um, to make that simulation or scenario even more realistic so there's greater buy-in for students. So this is all the things that you get in each kit. But again, you get three different scenarios with the props needed to do that scenario. And if you want more information on those, those are on our website, realityworks.com, and they're this um, skills sim kits. So we thought that that really related nicely to the, the content that Casey was presenting today. So at this point, we would like to make sure that we answer any remaining questions. Um, Emily's been out there being our, our moderator and uh, checking out the chat room. Emily, do you see any remaining questions uh, yeah. for you myself? Yeah, excuse me. It does look like we have a question. Is it appropriate to use online videos to show skills and actually use that and actually use some which show it incorrectly to use to show students the wrong way? Is it appropriate to do it that way? Um, we have done, um, overall, yes. Um, if the videos are the instructor showing um, the incorrect, I wouldn't use student videos um, if something was wrong. Um, I wouldn't use that. But you could demonstrate um, this is the um, this is the right way to do it. Um, another option that I want to throw out there is to demonstrate how to do it, like do that live. Um, do that like so they could see the simulation as you're doing it and say, what would happen if I did this? What is wrong with this? So um, have them walk through um, the, you know, get troubleshoot, have them, you know, say, well, that's not the right way because of, of X, Y, and Z. So um, you could perform a skill incorrectly, put it out there, and then on a discussion board, they had to reply on what they seen were the errors. That would be an option as well. Okay, and then we have another question. Um, how much are the kits? I want to make sure we're giving you the right pricing information. So I would actually have you go out to realityworks.com and um, and check that out. If you want to take another question, I will look into it and I will uh, I will get back to you in just a second on that. I want to make sure I'm accurate here. Yeah, and then um, it looks like that is all of the questions. We did have a question regarding the PowerPoint slides. We will be sending out a copy of the PowerPoint slides as well. Um, and then we have a question, how do you assess simulation? Do they have, do they have it done perfectly or is there a rubric? Do they have to do it perfectly or is there a rubric to use? <laughs> Sorry. We like to use rubrics uh, for everything. So it is a, if it's used for assessment, um, if it's used for practice, it's more of just giving them the, like the, the steps um, without points associated with them or anything like that to make sure that they're doing the steps correctly. But yes, we do use rubrics and there are rubrics with all of the Reality Works products as well. Perfect. And then we do have a question regarding, um, do we have medical assisting kits? We do not have any of those skills sim kits for a medical assisting right now. We started with nursing and CNA, but that is a product line that we would like to build out more in the future. Um, I hope I'm sharing my screen right now. I've got information up about um, showing the skills sim kits on our website. Uh, Emily, can you, can you see that? Nope, it's not on our screen. There's oh. nothing shared right now. Okay. Let me go back into, here we go. Now, can you see? Yes, perfect. Okay. 
So each of the each of the kits does come in a, a self-contained box. Um, you can click on any one of them to learn all of the contents that are in each kit. Um, and uh, the, the focus is what the three scenarios do focus on. Like, for example, here's one on adult acute care um, and everything that comes with it. And they're $9.99. So you can, uh, if you want more information on that, this is a great place to come out to on our website and check those out. And if anyone has specific requests for future kits, we would love to have you reach out to us and let us know, for example, uh, in medical assisting, what topics specific to that, or if there's other areas that you teach, we would be, we would love to, uh, to do more of that. And I know somebody asked about um, if we could share one of the, uh, like what a rubric looks like, and um, I'd be happy to do that, um, to send that out with the, um, with the recording? With the recording, yes. And I just also want to say that um, the methods shared today are evidence-based, um, so they just didn't come out of my head. <laughs> uh, they are based off of the simulation standards and um, what other schools and colleges are doing um, in this COVID times and what the suggestions are. Great. Any additional questions that we have out there, Emily? Nope, that looks like it. Um, that is it. Just to confirm, everybody will be receiving a, a link to the recording as well as a link to the presentation and then um, the rubric that uh, Casey mentioned. Fabulous. Well, thank you all very much for participating today. And we really want to thank Casey for being our presenter and sharing all of that, that great information and experience. Thank you, everyone.